Next slides are about transmission scanning, which currently is not used anymore, but I still think it's useful to, to know how it works because every now and then it pops up again and there are no methods that uh, make use of, of results that were found here. So in good old PET systems, there was no CT or MR connected to the system and still we need to do attenuation correction. And for that reason, there was a transmission source inside the scanners, um, which was used to do a, a transmission scan for attenuation. And so the way it would work is that, at least for the seamers, that's the system that I have experience with. There were a few rod sources. Here is just one, but they would typically, I think, be three. And they were hidden <coughs> in shielding in the scanner. And the scanner could get them automatically out of the shielding and make them rotate in the field of view. So they would rotate close to the detector. And while they're rotating, um, the uh, scan would be acquired. And so early in the morning, the scanner would wake up if, while no one was there and start doing a long blank scan of half an hour or an hour. And during a blank scan, that source is rotating all the time. And that means that every LOR, every now and then, gets to see the rot source because the, the rot source trajectory will uh, cross every LOR of the scanner. And we call that measurement the blank scan. So it measures how many photons you see with that transmission source if there is no patient. And this transmission source is germanium 68. So it's a half-life of nine months. So the decay between the blank scan and the transmission scan of that day is basically negligible. Okay, okay then a patient comes in and the patient, originally the patient was not injected yet, but put on the table like that. And then the transmission scan was done. And so the patient is asked not to move anymore because of course, once we measure the attenuation map, patient shouldn't move anymore because then uh, they would change the attenuation map. So we do the same scan. <coughs> and now of course we measure fewer photons because many of the photons that would be measured here are now attenuated by the patient. So that's written here. Without the patient, we would measure the same blank scan and with the patient, the blank scan is attenuated with the total attenuation along the yellow bar. So that's the very same attenuation that you would see in the PET scan because it doesn't matter if that activity is here or inside the patient or at the other side, the attenuation is the same uh, along the entire yellow bar. After the, tra the transmission, uh, yeah, this transmission scan would be short because we don't want to spend hours on a transmission scan. So this would be typically uh, five or 10 minutes. It would be a noisy scan. Then the transmission is retracted. The tracer is administered. And then um, depending on the tracer, we may have to wait a while and then do the transmission, the emission scan. And the emission scan is written like here. So what we want to measure is the total activity along the LOR, which is here, but that is attenuated again by the attenuation uh, along the LOR. And this is exactly the same as this. So that means that in principle, the correction is very simple. You take the scan you want, which is affected by attenuation, and you divide it um, by this one and multiply it with that one to get rid of that attenuation. Then in principle, you get the integral of the total activity unaffected by attenuation, and that you can simply reconstruct in 2D with uh, FPP. So here is what it would look like. So you get the blank scan, and the blank scan in this case is not uniform. So the whole uh, sinogram or almost the whole sinogram is irradiated, but not uniformly because if the, according to the PET scanner, the acquisition looks like the acquisition of a ring because it, during one scan, the source is rotating all the time and it, the PET measures the average. So it's the same as the forward projection of a ring. And the forward projection of a ring is not uniform because um, the LORs going through the sides of the ring will see more activity than the ones going through the center of the ring. Um, so that's why you see a bit more uh, intensity near, near the edges. But it doesn't matter, we have the blank scan, we will divide those effects away. Also, in principle, you have to normalize the, the scans. If you, in, in, in here, uh, if you exactly apply this equation, then you don't have to normalize because the normalization will be, will be divided away. 
in practice, people always normalize the blanket in the transmission scan because they've typically smoothed a bit to suppress the noise. And once you start smoothing, the, uh, that the normalization will no longer be divided away because it will be um, mixed with the data. Here is the transmission scan. So you get high intensity outside the patient and low intensity inside the patient. And that's a bit the tragedy of transmission imaging. The most important part is obviously where the patient is. And there you get the lowest amount of photons, so the highest amount of noise. So you get an excellent measurement of the background, but nobody cares. And then we have uh, to divide um, the transmission, the, the blank scan by the transmission scan that produces this. So basically it turns black into white, low values become high values. So these are the correction values that you would want to apply. Now still we typically reconstruct or reconstructed those transmission scans. And the reason is that if you apply directly this expression, then there is a problem. So the, the blank scan is almost noise free because we make it very long. And also because there is no attenuation, a large amount of photons have been measured. But the transmission scan is kept short because the, the patient is in the scanner. And therefore this transmission scan is noisy. And so not doing anything about the noise is a bad idea. So you could smooth it and smooth the, the blank scan similarly. But an even better way of suppressing the noise is reconstructing it. And then during the reconstruction, you can do all kinds of tricks to suppress the noise. And then you compute the forward correction again. That suppresses a lot of noise. And one reason to understand that is that if you uh, apply this expression, then for every LOR, you use a single measurement, which is the transmission scan of that along that LOR. If you first make a reconstruction and then do a forward projection, then that value will be a function of the entire image, uh, which is definitely better because you have used all or almost all of the data to, to compute that value. And so here are typical results. Um, this is the image that you get without attenuation correction. This is for long time of light. Bit. This is the reconstructed attenuation image <coughs> reconstructed with an iterative algorithm that I will explain later. And this is the, the attenuation corrected activity image. So for the attenuation image, you see that it cannot compete against CT. The resolution is poor. The contrast is very poor. And the reason the contrast is so poor is first, of course, there is a lot of noise, but also the measurement is done at 511 kilo electron volt. And at those high energies, the differences between tissue attenuation uh, are less than at lower energies. So if you like to see high tissue contrast, it's better to use very low energies. But um, the advantage is, of course, that we measure the attenuation at 511 kilo electron volt, which is exactly what we need. And then you see that if you don't correct a non-TOF PET image for attenuation, then you get a horrible image. For example, um, the the lung here is slightly more active than the surrounding tissues, while in reality, it's the other way around. Um, here, the liver is almost uniform. In this patient, it is not because of, of this liver lesion here. You see here that the liver is not uniform at all. It's cold in the center, uh, water near at the outside. So there are very large differences here. Always the skin looks like it's very active. In reality, that's not true at all. So this image is by no means quantitative. And unless you're used to looking at these images, uh, they're not visually attractive either. However, at that time, um, PET was almost exclusively used uh, for lesion detection with uh, FDG. And so FDG, avid tumors accumulate a lot of activity. And if you scan an hour after injection, then these lesions will be very active. And as you can see, all these hotspots are clearly displayed. So if all you want to do is to detect these hotspots and you don't care about the quantification, then those images are fine. And actually, because transmission scanning is a bit cumbersome, it makes the scan longer. Um, a long time, people have been using uh, these non-attenuation corrected images for detection. But then uh, more recently, PET is more and more being used for treatment evaluation, where we do a scan before treatment and then shortly after treatment, another scan to see if the treatment has effect. And then they want to see even small differences between activity accumulated in the tumors. 
then you need quantification, and then you need to do attenuation correction. So those images are not popular at all. Now the same, or well, similar tricks have been proposed in SPECT, and actually the vendors and a lot of researchers have done great efforts to produce transmission scanning in SPECT, but that was actually never accepted because the medical doctors usually don't use SPECT for image quantification. That's only changing recently now. And they felt that for visual inspection, all that transmission didn't help that much. And in fact, they were even disturbed by it because they were so used to the artifacts uh, that they had stored them in their internal databases. And by doing attenuation correction, you do away with the good old artifacts and actually you introduce a few new ones. And they were not used to the new ones. So the whole thing was never accepted, although there were many good ideas. And here is one of them. So suppose this is a, a radioactive line source, a long leaf tracer. And then you put a collimator in front such that that source can only send uh, photons in a small spatial window. And then you scan that window uh, from left to right. And because there is collimators here and here, you can put a significant amount of activity here such that many photons go there. Now in SPECT, we have multiple energies, so we can put a different energy in, in uh, sorry, a different isotope in that uh, transmission source then is used for the tracer for the yeah for the tracer. And typically one would choose uh, isotopes that have an energy that is lower than the energy of the isotope combined with the tracer. And the tracer is usually technetium, so this would be 140. And one popular uh, transmission source was gadolinium, which has an energy of I think around 100 keV, which is well below the emission peak. And the idea was, if you do that, then these transmission uh, photons will not hamper the emission, because even if they're detected, they will be rejected because they have too low an energy. Of course, if you do that, then the transmission measurement is affected by the emission measurement. So, but one way to reduce that effect is to do exactly this. You put a lot of activity here. So in that small window, most of the photons are actually transmission photons because you can put relatively high amounts of activity there. In addition, you can tell the computer, only here you should expect transmission photons. That means just before and after that source passes along uh, a particular position, what you measure there should be only emission. And that means that you have always a good estimate of the emission contribution in your transmission. And then the good old um, triple energy method is applied here because of course now we have scattered from the transmission source, but also from the emission activity. And that's the reason to put two windows, assuming that those windows will just measure the scatter contributions, then we add them, filter them, uh, find a good uh, weight for them and subtract them to get the uh, transmission counts. All right, so this is just one of, of many examples that I could give. There were even uh, traces with much higher energy than the emission, which would send their photos through the collimator. So you could put a point source, do a kind of fan beam reconstruction using the entire crystal. Uh, there were all kind of clever solutions, but they never really made it. So it cannot have been sold with transmission sources. And actually in our hospital, we had a few, and then we found that they don't use them. And then the money for replacing the sources when they decay is pretty high. So they decided to not do that anymore because they didn't feel that the transmission added a lot in their SPECT um, imaging. Okay, so as I said before, um, there are two reasons to reconstruct this scan. And one is, as I said, if we reconstruct them for projected, we get less noise in our transmission data. And another reason is that it gives very poor, but at least some anatomical information, which, for example, in this case matters because you see that this tumor is sitting yeah, at the edge of the liver and they want to know is it actually a lung tumor close to the liver or a liver tumor close to the lung. And you can see it in the transmission image too. So, and, and they are measured almost simultaneously. So we typically have less mismatch between the attenuation and the emission in this kind of images than with uh, PET-CT. And so they felt that it is of some help. 
or they like it for anatomical reference too. Okay, so initially they were reconstructed with FDP, but as you can guess, FDP did not a very good job. We had low counts, we had lots of noise, so streaks everywhere, and that's another reason to use MLM. And because MLM was very successful in emission, uh, many researchers tried to do a similar thing for transmission tomography. Now, the problem is that the forward model, which is this, um, has now uh, the line integrals in the exponent and that never occurred for emission tomography. So that means that the likelihood is a uh, different function from the unknown than it is in emission tomography. And that means that you need to do a new derivation to find maximum likelihood algorithms. So many of those have been invented. Actually, initially one just applied the expectation maximization approach to transmission tomography and it works. But the problem is that you need to introduce this complete data. You recall that I introduced this X, I, J, the number of photons emitted from every voxel along the LOR that is introduced in the expectation maximization algorithm. But fortunately, they vanished from the calculations such that we never have to compute them because there are a huge amount of those. It turns out in transmission tomography that these complete variables don't want to go away. So you need to estimate them too, and there are really many, many of them. So that makes the algorithms inefficient, and that's why people have been looking at different ways to maximize the likelihood. So we did away with that EM because uh, there was no expectation maximization here. We used different algorithms, and because there now was a vacancy here, people put the R there for transmission, suggesting that the EM originally was for emission, which is not true, of course. All right, so this is the likelihood. We have the transmission measurement. We have our known blank scan, and we can assume this one is basically noise-free. This one is subject to noise. And this is the forward model, so the blank scan attenuated by the unknown attenuation. And there can be random scatter inspector will be a contribution from the emission actually in PET. Uh, later, there was a contribution from the uh, activity too, as I will show uh, in a few slides. And otherwise, this is exactly the same uh, expression as before. So y times the logarithm of the expectation minus the expectation. So now we need to maximize that. And yeah, I will not go in detail, but lots of algorithms have been uh, presented and we invented one too. So that's of course, because I'm biased, this is ours. So we have a blank scan, we have a transmission scan that goes in here. We assume this one to be noise-free, this one to be subject to Poisson noise. Then you get an algorithm that is iterative as before. And then uh, you get a maximum likelihood reconstruction. And it shares a lot of features with the maximum likelihood reconstruction for emission tomography. So it also has non-uniform convergence of the resolution. Um, it also doesn't produce streaks, but it likes to incorporate the noise in the image to maximize the likelihood. So if you iterate forever, the resolution will get better and better, but the noise will accumulate more and more. And so also as in emission tomography, at lower iterations, the resolution is poor and the noise is very limited. So you could use stopping rules as a kind of low pass. Now here, if this thing is to be used only for attenuation correction, it's actually a good idea to iterate pretty long and not bother too much about that noise because that noise is highly negatively correlated. And if you compute line integrals through those images, a lot of that noise will cancel. And even if this looks horrible, if you forward project it, you get a pretty uh, good uh, uh, sinogram, which is far less noisy than the original one. Okay, so you, you could do a little bit of smoothing. Um, here, compute the exponent, and then you get this, uh, this uh, attenuation correction sign. All right, so what I initially explained is the cold transmission scan, which was the most intuitive thing to do because you don't want a transmission scan corrupted by uh, the emission activity, but it's very cumbersome for clinical practice. And, and here you can easily see why. So the patient comes in, <coughs> is put on the scanner, <clears throat> transmission scan is done, 
then the tracer is injected, and then we have to wait. And for FDG, for example, for oncology applications, you have to wait like an hour because you need to give the tracer time to accumulate sufficiently in the tumor lesions, and that takes time. So the patient is lying here for an hour and is supposed to not move, which is horrible for healthy people and is even more horrible for patients. And also, it's not the optimal use of a very expensive machine to put someone in there and not scan. And then when we have reason to believe the tracer has arrived where it should be, then the emission scan is done. And then the patient comes out and is very, very happy that the scan is done because a lot of time has passed. <clears throat> so for that reason, people quickly said, no, no, this, this is not doable. We're going to do it the other way around. Patient comes in, we will inject the patient and tell the patient, don't run around anymore, stay quiet, because we don't want the FTG to accumulate in their muscles. The FTG should accumulate in their lesions. But they can be sitting quietly here or lying on the bed, depending on their condition. And then uh, we wait like an hour here, put the patient on in the scanner, do the transmission or the emission measurement immediately followed by the transmission measurement. And actually for whole body imaging, this was done pretty efficiently. So you do for this particular position, the emission scan and immediately after that, the transmission scan. Then with the transmission sources still in the field of view, you move the patient and you do the transmission scan in the next bed position, retract the source and do the emission scan. And that way you go on. So that reduced the, or, or suppressed the, the time needed to get the sources in and out because that takes time too. And it also ensures that the transmission measurement and the emission measurement are always done in sequence for every bed position. Meaning that if the patient moves here, then that motion will not affect the second bed position. In PET-CT, we do it the other way around. We scan the patient entirely with the CT, and then we do bed by bed acquisition. And that means that for the last bed position, there was a long time between when the CT image was made of that position and when we measure the activity, the chances that the patient moved uh, in between are pretty high. So actually motion mismatches were less likely to occur. And if they did occur, they were more local than they are now. Okay, so and this thing is relatively practical. It extends the transmission just with a few minutes. So it, it was working uh, pretty well. In addition, you can do the same trick as I showed in the uh, for spect imaging before. The sources are rotating, but the scanner knows where they are. So the scanner can tell us at every time in the list mode file, for example, the source is now here. And then we know only LORs that go through one of the sources, there will typically be a few around. Only those LORs can have anything to do with transmission. If they're not going through that source, they are emission, they're scattered or whatever. And in that way, uh, the contribution from non-transmission measurements could be suppressed dramatically. So here is the, the new algorithm. Now we have a blank scan, a transmission scan, but also an emission scan, because we either have an emission scan just before or just after the transmission scan. And now those are input to that algorithm. And so the emission scan goes in here as an additive contribution. I should have put a weight in here because, because of the electronic window, the, we can take the emission scan and we know that only a few percent of that emission uh, activity can actually get into that transmission scan because most of it will be rejected by the electron. So we can account for that contribution and then everything is the same as before. We iterate, uh, the longer we iterate, the more noise we get, the better the resolution. We can forward project it and that produces either the attenuation values or the attenuation correction values, depending on what you want to do afterwards. So here is uh, again such a result. Um, and now I have these maximum intensity projections, so you get an idea of the quality of these images. So this, this is uh, the typical quality, which get better and better of the activity images. And this is what you get if you estimate the attenuation from the transmission data. And that looks very similar to what we see these days if we estimated the attenuation values from the TOF PET data themselves. So they have similar resolution, similar uh, noise, and the quality of the attenuation images is a bit like this. <clears throat> 